So if you'd like to turn to page 1044 in the Pew Bibles, we're reading from the beginning of chapter 3 of Colossians. Now, um, this is the start. We, we learnt last week about, uh, well, we are reminded from our series a couple of years ago about being um, transferred and then transformed. So Paul's been discussing the transferal um, up until this point, and now he begins a section on being transformed. So, so if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now, put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. In Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Now just... Um, I've had a little bit of feedback on my sermons that I tend to get quiet at the end of my sentences, some from the sound deck back there. So if someone's struggling to hear because I get quiet at the end of my sentences, just do something like that so that I, I, want, I want to work on it. I appreciate the feedback. Last week we heard a great message, didn't we? A great message about being hidden in Christ what that means for the identity and existence of everyone who has faith in Christ. It's a profound passage, this one. It has a depth and a significance we will not plumb today or even in this earthly life. Bernard reminded us of all that we have before God when we are with Christ. He reminded us that this union and its benefits are accessed in one way, one way only, Trust Christ. And yet I, as I prepared for this sermon, which starts with the same passage, it struck me that I had not given all that significance and all those benefits a lot of thought through the week. And here I am preparing the sermon for today. So let me ask you the question that confronted me. How much did you think about last week's sermon through the week? How much did you think about what it means to be hidden in Christ? How deeply did you search into or think on the glorious depths of that little phrase, hidden in Christ? Maybe your thoughts were like mine, all about killing the weeds and getting the weed into trucks and off farm or worrying about my worker who's already hurt himself. Maybe your thoughts were about shopping for weekly food or trying to keep the relatives at peace. We have to deal with all that stuff, don't we? That's part of this life. But in this passage, Paul tells us, seek the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So how much do you seek the things above? How 
how much was your mind set on the things above? Mine wasn't. As we look at our passage today, I think those questions will help us see what Paul is driving at in the following verses about being transformed in our daily lives. Let me pray. Father, I said on the way in to Phil, I feel so unqualified to speak on this passage. You are good enough in your mercy to show me some of my sin and I am sure to show some of our, my brothers and sisters their sin and the battles continue. Lord, help us today as we look at this passage to understand who we are in Christ and to know that the victory is won. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, of course, was also the beginning of our series on the good life. We started in Colossians with the first four verses, which I read again today. Colossians is about God's people being a people who have been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son. And as a result of that transfer, their lives are transformed, changed forever. Now they live with Jesus as their Lord. It is part of that transformed life that we're going to look at. In his letter, Paul is also trying to stop some of the Colossians being drawn away from their trust in Jesus. Some people have come into the community with a message that the Colossians aren't getting all that the Christian life can be. There's more. They need to do more if they're going to be really spiritual. They need to stick to some religious laws about food and festivals. And Paul writes to say, stick to Christ. Hold to him. He is all and everything you need. But this sermon series is about the good life. So what is the good life? Now, that's a philosophical discussion that's been going on, well, for millennia. As Christians, we have a reference point, a marker for what the good life looks like. He's a man, Jesus, the one who lived the only righteous life. But Jesus is far more than just a model it would be good to emulate. Through faith in him, we have become united with him. There is a relationship established. It is through trust in what he has done that we get, we get to live the good life. So someone who is living the good life might well say, I am with Christ and life is good. I am with Christ and life is good. To put it another way, to be separated from Christ is to make living the good life impossible. Impossible. The false teachers are not living the good life. In chapter 2, verse 19, Paul tells us what they are not doing. They are not holding fast to the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with growth from God. That then is the good life, a life that holds fast to Christ and grows in him with a growth from God. A life that holds fast to Christ, clings to him and grows in him with a growth that comes from God. Bernard helped us see and understand some of the good things that are ours because we are united with Christ. Our identity, our security, our assurance, our daily decision-making are all changed by being with Christ. Now, we're going to turn to a slightly different part of life now, aren't we? 
I'm going to begin at verse 5. Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. So as we saw in the kids' talk, you are to put, we, shouldn't say you, we are to put the things, put to death the things of our earthly nature. Therefore tells us that this passage follows on from our being united with Christ and our future appearing with him in glory. Because we died with Christ and our lives are now hidden in him, because of that, we are to put to death the things that belong to our earthly nature. Now, Paul lists five sins that do not go with or belong to those who are hidden in Christ. These sins are characteristic of the disobedient. They will be under God's wrath when it comes. They should not be present among God's people. But then he says to put away some other things as well. But now, put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self. You are being renewed in knowledge according to the image of your creator. He gives us five more sins, plus an extra, which we are to put away. Other translations say we are to put them off, like changing clothes, as we saw demonstrated to us this morning. There is an old self that is earthly and not thinking on the things above, not seeking the things above. That self we are to take off and throw away. And then there is a new self, a new self which is being renewed, remade, if you like, in knowledge according to the image of God. Its focus is on things above. It thinks on things above and it is drawn to them. That is why I asked my question earlier today. How deeply did you think into, did you search into or think on the glorious depths of what it is to be hidden in Christ? Now some of you might say that Paul hasn't been very helpful to you. You might want to know what you have to do in a response to a passage like this. Paul has told me I need to put these sins to death or put them away. He hasn't told me how to do it. First, let me say what he has told us. He has given us a list of sins. And if you look down that list, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, greed, I'm sure that most of us know that we have to deal with at least one of those sins. I am sure of that. Paul says, put them to death. Kill them. He is certainly not saying we should surrender to them. He is certainly not saying that we should weaken occasionally. Even once is too much. These are sins which do immense damage to us as God's image bearers and to God as we are his image bearers to others. Their presence in our lives are a sign that we still bear the characteristics of the disobedient. Likewise with the second group of sins, Paul says to put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, filthy language and lies are not the garments. They are not the garments of Christ or his people. Now, if you think about these sins, they're aimed at other people. They are sins which damage the fellowship of believers. We are to put them far away. 
We are not to speak in that way anymore. We are not to indulge in those moods anymore. We are not to get angry anymore. We are to be robed in the new self, which is Christ with us. That's what we're to put on. The knowledge that we are hidden in Christ. We are to know that and know it deeply. There'll be more about the new self that we put on next week. But think for a moment about the knowledge that you are hidden in Christ. Paul, in verse 11, directs us to consider the logical extension of that fact. We are all, all believers, hidden in Christ. As we get angry with each other, as we tell little falsehoods to each other, Paul directs us to remember that there should be no such sin between us. Christ is all and in all. If I pause for a moment and you look around at the other folks sitting here, do you see Christ in them? We are all hidden in Christ, brothers and sisters in him, all united to him. The person in this congregation you find it hardest to love is hidden in Christ. You love Christ. They are perfect in Christ, we heard last week. Hard to think that way, isn't it? As we fail to love each other as we should, these particular sins, the ones Paul has named here, will do lots of harm to our fellowship and to our witness to the community around us. Now, one of the questions that arises for me, certainly, and I'm sure for many of you, the conflict between the old earthly self and the new self that is hidden with Christ. Why do I keep on sinning when I don't want to sin anymore? If I'm perfect with Christ, why is it so hard to stop sinning? Now, I have two different answers which help me to understand why I have that experience myself. Firstly, I direct you to the other reading that Roz brought us, and I thank her for putting up with my late change. It's one of my favourite passages because I find it so easy to relate to. In all the have-to-dos and wanting-to-dos and to-dos and don't-dos, it bears reading carefully. Paul writes of that very same conflict. He writes of the conflict between his inner self and the members of his body. It begins with, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Does that sound like you struggling with sin? It certainly sounds like me struggling with sin. And he's exasperated almost by the end of it. And what does he say? Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will deliver me? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He has done it. He has delivered us. Paul has the struggle, the same struggle we have, but he knows that Christ's already dealt with it. And so he gives thanks. The other answer is that our perspective is wrong. One of the things the devil does is he keeps getting us to look at ourselves with earthly eyes. We see our weakness, we see our failures, we see our lack of faith, see all the things we do wrong. We see how frail we are. We certainly see all those things in other people. 
We see how many times we're angry or jealous and we think we will never be good enough for God. I put it to you, we have not thought enough on the things above. We have not looked at ourselves with God's eyes. We have not read God's word enough. In God's sight, we are hidden with Christ. Now, which is the reality? Our earthly sight or God's sight? Which reality counts, if there are two? We can either look at everything with God's eyes or we can look at everything with earthly eyes. In God's eyes, believers are perfect. In our earthly eyes, we are such sinners. We're not trying to be good enough. That will not work. We are weak, frail sinners who need delivering. But we are also already perfect. We are those who are trying to honour and glorify and who give thanks to our Lord, the one who has made us perfect in him. I, had, I thought of an illustration on the way in. I've been debating with myself whether to use it. I'm going to. Um, I played in a cricket team in a grand final once and I was the oldest player there and there were a bunch of young blokes. And we got out for, I don't know, 85 or something, very low score. And so there was very little hope that we're going to win this game. And we did the big rev up speech beforehand and got ourselves all worked up. And we went out there and they got 20 odd or something before they lost a wicket. And then, and then we got three or four quick wickets and hope just went. And the bowlers ran in harder and the fielders chased the ball harder. If somebody had come to us and said, you will win this game. You have already won this game. But what happened was their best batsman came in and belted two or three sixes and everything went... (laughs) Now, to me, that's a little like our battle with sin. When we fail... Do we turn to our Lord and listen to his words? You are hidden with Christ. You have all he has. You will return with him in glory. Imagine how that refreshes for the battle with our sin. If you like, the bowlers would have run in harder. The fielders would have kept fielding harder because they knew they were going to win, but they still had to work hard. I'm now going to do something I consider a little dangerous because I propose a course of action for fighting sin. Now, if the course of action helps you, very good. If the course of action becomes your focus and not Christ our Lord, if he isn't your focus, throw it away. But I'm trying to summarise what I think Paul is proposing here. First things first, have faith in Christ, in all he is, in all he has accomplished. Be united with him. If you are truly his, your heart and your mind will be continually drawn to things above, to Christ, to knowing him better, to appreciating more deeply what he has done and understanding better who you are because you're united to him. Now that will 
form, your heart, your mind and your eyes. And the things of our earthly nature, this is nearly like a song, will become pale and tawdry, maybe even shameful and possibly downright repulsive. We will recognise how unworthy we are and we'll see some of the damage we do as we sin and we will know that we need a deliverer. But we already have him. We already have him. And then do what Paul has done. Name the sin. Name the battle you are having right at this minute. It's hard to fight an enemy you haven't identified. And one of the things that happened as you set your mind on things above is that God will show you more of your sin. He will show you different sins and he will show you old sins which keep returning Confess your sin and repent of it. Put it to death. Throw it away. Not in your own strength, but in the strength of knowing Christ has won the victory. You are perfect in him. If you like, you will win the Greek again. And then... Be renewed in your knowledge of what brings glory to Christ by again, always setting your mind on things above. On Christ sitting at the right hand of God and his righteousness being your righteousness. On being hidden with Christ in God. In all those steps, Christ is at the centre. We are to continue to seek above, to think on things above. If we do that, if we love Christ with all our hearts, we will will put to death our sins. Our sins will grieve us because they grieve Christ. They will grieve us because he had to bear God's wrath for each and every one of them. I heard on the television the other night, it's a cricket day today, a cricket commentator said that the thing to do as a captain was whatever the opposite team least wanted you to do. I cannot think of anything the devil hates more than you thinking about Christ, who he is what he has done and who you are with him. By seeking the things above, by thinking on things above, we realign. God transforms us, our thinking, our sight and our lives. The good life holds to Christ in all things and grows in him with a growth that comes from God. The good life puts sin to death. It throws sin away. The good life is lived by those who know they are hidden with Christ and therefore put off the old self and put on the new self. So live the good life, brothers and sisters, because you... All who believe in him have died with Christ, have been raised with him and are hidden in him.